In this final tutorial of the series, we'll quickly examine some of the tools Grasshopper and other plugins provide for capturing animations and generating documentation. So go ahead and open the file contextmodel.3dm in the 3.3 animation and capture download. And we're going to start with the file called animations begin. And this is a file that is set up with a dynamic pipeline, which is loading in some meshes, and then a mechanism for essentially scaling those for a kind of visual effect. So if I kind of drag this up and down, it's going to scale those visually. And that's the thing that we want to animate. So I'm going to go to my perspective view, and we want to create an animation of this process. So. One of the things that I've done is I've put this through a kind of gentle S-curve via the, uh, the graph mapper component from under params input graph mapper. Um, because when you're creating an animation, if whatever you're driving passes through a kind of subtle, it's called easing in, uh, in kind of animation circles, an easing curve, then it will slightly accelerate and slightly de decelerate and it makes your animations look a little bit better. We can even exaggerate a little bit for the purposes of this. And we've got a custom preview set up to render this geometry in gray. And so what we want to do is output an animation of this growth process. And Grasshopper right out of the box provides a means to do that. Um, anything that's controlled by a slider can be animated. You right click and choose animate. And then let's go find a place, I'm going to call it example frames, we'll click OK. And then you can specify the number of frames that you want, uh, which let's just do 100 for now. You can grab the resolution of your current viewport by clicking this button. You can tell it which viewport if you have multiple ones open. And you can always get a preview over here of what you're going to see in the, one of the frames of the animation. But we're looking at the perspective view, so let's use that. Uh, and so what we want is uh, basically just this. And what I would recommend is to convert the file name template to use PNG rather than JPG. For some reason, JPEGs don't get output properly by this dialog. It ends up creating pings anyway, and then but calls them JPEGs, so they won't open in Photoshop. So just go ahead and use uh, ping. And we're going to click OK. And you can see it's going to move evenly across the slider and save out each step of the way as an image frame in this directory. So we can then use a tool like Photoshop to compose that into a proper animation. So we can go File, Open, go find that on the desktop as Sample Frames, I think I called it, or Sample Frames. and when you click open, make sure you select the first one and choose image sequence. And that's what will tell Photoshop to load all the frames in at once. You can specify a frame rate. I'm going to leave it at 15. And there's an additional palette called the timeline, which I have minimized down here. You may need to go to window timeline in order to make it visible. But we can preview our animation um, by clicking this play button. And we have a couple options for longer, more sort of complex graphics that we want in high quality. What I typically do is go to File, Export, Render Video. And then we can specify a destination for a video file. Um, you can set it to use your document size. I would make sure that it's an MP4 file and that you're using the H.264 encoder. You'll get the best results from that. Um, probably want to always use your document frame rate. If you want things to be faster when you bring them in, just output, uh, use a sort of a frame rate of 30. You can also output more frames during the grasshopper process to sort of bring in better resolution, uh, better sort of time resolution. Um, and then we'll go ahead and say, all right, example animation one, and then click render. And this will save out a video file that you could, you know, embed in a PowerPoint presentation or, you know, upload to the web via YouTube or whatever else. Um, now, I also like 
for simple, short, repeating animations to create animated GIFs. And you can actually do that without changing anything about your Photoshop file. If you go to File, Save for Web, make sure your preset is set to use GIF. And you probably don't want anything this big, so we might reduce its size to like 400 just to make the file size a little bit smaller. So there is a trade-off. GIF files are really not designed for long videos, but for something little that you might like put on a web page or something like that, this is a great way to go. Um, you can specify all of your color settings. You might want to play with some of the presets. Um, and you know, right now I've got a very low color count because I'm just dealing with grayscale, but you might need to beef those up for better color resolution. And all of these settings will control the quality and you'll get a preview between sort of the original and the optimized result. And then you may also want to specify forever as the loop if you want it to just always play, uh, play back and forth. And it'll be slower in the preview than it will be in reality. And go ahead and click Save, and then we'll say GIF example. And if we fire up a browser and go find that GIF example, let's just see GIF example, uh, then we can see that as a little image over here. Um, and this will just loop infinitely. Um, so those are two ways of using the output from an animated slider to create either a video or an animated GIF. Now, we may want to get more sophisticated. What if we want to move the camera while this animation is happening? So uh, we can control the position of the camera in the Rhino viewport using a component from Human called Modify Viewport. So under Document, uh, so under the human tab, this document tab, modify viewport. And this takes a lot of inputs, but most of them are optional. Most of them already have a sort of useful default value. So uh, we can specify the viewport name that we want to animate, which in this case is unnecessary. It'll just use the active viewport. Really all we care about is a camera location and a camera target. So I'm going to use the zero, 00 point of this model, which is somewhere right here in the middle, as my camera target. And it, you'll see right away it will actually adjust the viewport. And I've got a very wide viewport right now. So sometimes what I do to square up my viewport is I just make my layers palette really large, which I know is like a little goofy, but it seems to work. And we can. What I'm going to do is take another point. This one is at a uh, thousand and a thousand, and actually I'm scaling it up so it's three thousand, three thousand in the x, three thousand in the z, and then I'm rotating it in the x y plane by uh, another slider, and this is going to be our camera location. So conceptually, what we have is sort of a point up in space, um, which maybe we'll be able to see in another viewport if I turn on this preview. So here's our point, and if I rotate it with this, I'm sort of moving it around in a circle around the outside of my model. So this is a way to create kind of a turntable animation, but anything you can create as a point, um, or a pair of points with a location and a target, you can use to animate your viewport. So we can actually use the same slider to control this camera rotation. You'll notice that rather than setting up the slider to be from 0 to 2 pi, which is the number of radians in a circle, I'm multiplying it or remapping it. And so that means I can use this same slider, which is controlling the sort of growth of our little uh, city over here, as the driver, meaning we can hook this one slider uh, up to control both things, to control both the camera movement and the growth. And this is generally how I'm composing animations in Grasshoppers. I have one master slider that lives in the range from 0 to 1, and then I just multiply or remap it to whatever actual value set I need it to be uh, for the purposes of the animation. So you can take this one slider and use it to drive many things at the same time in order to create an animation. Um, now, finally, we may enter into a more complex scenario where we actually want to capture multiple views at once. This is really useful if you want to say like automate the documentation of many different buildings in a master plan or something like that. That's something that um, 
is harder to do with the animation slider. Um, so we're still gonna use a sort of animate slider as the driver, um, but we're gonna hook it into another component from human uh, called uh, capture view to file or save viewport to file right here, this little camera. And what this guy needs is a Boolean toggle for run. So we'll just create one of those. Set this to, actually, we won't set it to true just yet. A viewport name. And the nice thing about this component is that it accepts lists. So we can say, actually, I want to capture the front view and the right view and the perspective view all at once. And so we'll take that and we'll supply that as our viewport name. There's a toggle for render, which if you have geometry in your Rhino environment and you want to work with this, um, you can cause it to trigger like a V-Ray render, but we won't deal with that for now. We'll leave it false. And then a file path to save. So here, um, what we've got is a, uh, a few pieces. We're using this string format component. If you look back in one of the earlier tutorials in part one, I think there was some more detail about how string format works. But essentially, it's a way of setting up a format where we're going to put placeholders into our text. So one of these is the directory, which we have an in input to. One of them is the viewport name, which we have an in input one. And then the last one is the frame number, which is just in input zero and set to be formatted as a three digit number. So you can see I'm generating these sort of three file names, frame perspective 100, frame front 100, and frame right 100. And I'm supplying using the relative path component from MetaHopper, I've got uh, the kind of absolute path to the frames folder. Um, and then I've got, I'm remapping my slider value, which again is from zero to one, to be uh, one to a hundred. And then uh, I'm supplying all of my viewport names, which I've typed in as a list in this text panel. So if this list of file paths corresponds to that one, and I'm gonna go into the folder for this, and I probably already have some frames in here, but I'm going to delete them. As soon as I set this to true and switch back over to that folder, you'll see that it automatically captures all three at once. So I can use this in tandem with this animation slider um, and run it again. But this time, it's going to capture every one of those frames. So there we go. Um, so. We could even have this set up to output things to uh, different um, different folders, but this I think should allow us to say, go open. I'm going to navigate to that directory, which is over here, and I'm going to say, give me all the frame fronts. Open that as an image sequence, and this time, yeah, let's just use 15 again, and. Give me all of the frame perspective and open that as an image sequence. Hold on, frame perspective. Where's our first one? Uh, there it is. Open as an image sequence. And then we're going to do the same thing with that last one, which is frame right, and open that as an image sequence. And Photoshop bring these, brings these in as video layers. Um, so we can actually just use the move tool to drag this entire layer. Uh, I think you actually have to drag it from over here. Uh, and we have to make sure that we don't put these in a video group. A video group is a way that Photoshop uses to basically say, play these sequentially in our timeline. We don't want to do that. We want to kind of keep them outside of a video group and I'm going to delete my video group. And I also now have to drag this in the timeline so that they are properly aligned. And then I'm going to drag this one as well into that same file. And we're going to need a little more room so we can see this all. Um, so I'm going to use the crop tool in Photoshop to just add a little bit more space. Um, if you didn't know that, you can actually use uh, crop to expand your canvas in addition to shrinking it. And I'm going to use the move tool to basically lay these out. So I've got one over here, one over here, and then one over here. And 
I could maybe crop these again and produce like a little background or something if I wanted. So why don't we do that? I'm gonna create one more layer and I'm gonna fill it with, uh, probably not red, fill it with black uh, and move it to the back. And we have to make sure whenever we create a new regular layer in Photoshop, we have to make sure that its duration matches the rest of the animation. But now we can see the same animation happening across multiple views at the same time, which is kind of a useful tactic. Um, so uh, taking advantage of that tool uh, will let you save out many views at a time. And sometimes you're not even trying to create an animation. Maybe you just want to use this as sort of an item selector to capture many things in sequence, and you can use this component in exactly the same way.